Hello, welcome to Donaldson Clean Solutions webinar, preparing your site for clean diesel. Have a plan for installation, what parts do you need, and exactly how to implement it. The objectives for today's presentation include what to consider before you begin installation, how to make sure your system is functional and serviceable once it's installed, and how to put it all together. Best practices in diesel fuel are important, uh, and that's the, the goal of your, uh, your installation here. So what needs to be considered before installation? Uh, keep in mind our, our general uh, philosophy of clean your fuel and your equipment, uh, protect the fuel that you have in storage, and polish it on the way out to, keep, uh, to, to purchase and keep your fuel clean. Here's an image showing a filtration of fuel on delivery into a small tank farm. You can see one of the tanks in the background has a uh, breather on it for protecting fuel in that small dispensing tank. The main dispenser is the dual head with two filters in the middle there. That goes out to a high flow hose reel filling uh, excavation equipment at a small contractor. Uh, the concept is the same for an even larger system, say a, a mine site or a large heavy duty operation. You're getting fuel delivered in in high volume off of a tanker truck, uh, using that pump to push the fuel into the into the tank farm and pop, uh, clean that fuel at that point. Uh, put breathers on the tanks, all the tanks in the farm to protect them. And then filtration on the way out as you're filling equipment or fuel hauling trucks, that kind of thing on site. Uh, the concept is basically the same, no matter how big or how small the system it is, to clean the fuel when you take possession of it protect it in clean storage tanks and polish it to uh, on the way out to ensure that it's clean enough for your uh, probably the biggest uh, issue that people may tend to skip over is to clean the tanks first before you implement a clean practice of cleaning your fuel on delivery and trying to polish it on the way out and by a good tank cleaning I mean a good tank cleaning to get all the stuff out um, this is an example of a drained fuel tank. You can see microbial contamination and sludge piling up in the bottom of this tank. You can see it was uh, several inches up the walls of the tank and, you, and all that solids left over there. If you do a uh, sort of a limited job of stirring the stuff around and trying to clean it up, you will plug many, many filters as this stuff continues to get picked up by the, the pump and, and uh, plug filters on the outlet over and over and over. Uh, it's far better to do a thorough job, get it scrubbed down to bare metal. Uh, you can see the effects of corrosion here on the bottom of this tank wall to some degree, but most all of that material is gone, and you're starting with a relatively clean set of infrastructure before you install filtration on the inlet and the outlet. And you, the idea is to keep this as clean as possible to ensure fuel quality going forward and a low cost of operation So this webinar is not around you know, high tech things for the most part. It is generally on how to get from, I bought some filters and some parts, manifolds and that kind of thing. How do I get it installed and get it connected uh, and make it usable? Um, we use a couple of different styles of connections for these installations. Uh, all the manifolds come with uh, ASME or ANSI 150 pound flanges and code 61 flanges, which are a hydraulic connection. We'll get into a little bit more detail here. But you'll see this is flange connections to, to industrial piping that's welded. Uh, these are high flow installations where you're offloading off a of tanker trucks, things like that, in three or four inch pipes. Um, they're well proven as uh, good connections for handling fuels and not leaking and, and having issues. Uh, here's the uh, dispenser side of the same system, and you can see it's high flow dispensing. It has manifolds with the uh, uh, two inch uh, ANSI 150 pound flanges. And you can see the code 61 flanges that connect to the filter heads at the, in the manifold there. Uh, those are a nice, clean, neat, leak proof connection, both the ANSI 150 pound flange and the hydraulic flanges, the code 61 flanges. Uh, in comparison to NPT, which everyone loves to plumb things in NPT because it's easy and it's common, on diesel fuel, NPT has a significant issue. It tends to leak. There is a thread tape available for doing diesel and fuel connection, piping connections with NPT thread. 
it's compatible with diesel fuel, but NPT threaded connections tend to leak because as temperature changes come along, uh, those threads tend to loosen up and diesel fuel is a very thin fluid and it tends to wick down the threads. You can see all the connections in this image that are NPT are wetted with fuel and you can see the hoses that are dry where there are no connections nearby. Um, it just signifies this is very, very common what NPT thread looks like. It'll be dirty around the, the connections, even on a dispenser pump that's equipped with them uh, where you're plumbing in and out. It's likely to leak and you'll wind up with dirt uh, sticking all over that those connections uh, showing off that, that propensity to leak. It's, it's common, but it does tend to, tend to be a dirty, uh, uh, dirty uh, situation when it's connected that way. Uh, the types, what makes the, the flanges work, uh, the, the ANSI 150-pound flanges are a, a gasket between those two large faces. This is a code 61 split flange. It uh, presses that O-ring you can see in the center there onto a flat surface is a very well proven low and high pressure leak proof connection. Uh, here's another style of flange. This is what's included in the kits for uh, uh, our, our product line. It has the code 61 flange that connects to the filter heads and there's an NPT version there because people really like to plumb an NPT. And then there's an SAE version. SAE is a straight thread connection with an O-ring seal. Um, it's Somewhat easy to confuse with NPT, but it is a, a, another hydraulic style connection that routinely does not leak. Uh, keeps things nice and neat and, and clean. Here's an example of an SAE uh, uh, filter head plumbed in, and this is, happens to be a lube truck. Uh, but you can see the high pressure hoses there for this is for dispenser, high pressure lube dispensers. But those are SAE connections. They look like standard hydraulic connections you've seen all over the place. They don't, uh, they don't leak. Uh, it's very unusual for them to leak. Um, we have those connections on the bulk HP product line. Uh, we sell gauges and sample ports with those types of connections for nice, neat, clean installations. Um, so something with a gasket or an O-ring seal is the, is the uh, ideal connection to keep things clean. Uh, here's an example of a fitting that threads into a into an SAE connection. You can see that O-ring pointed out there with the arrow on the bottom. That seals into that little gland at the top of the thread, straight threads and seals things up permanently. Uh, some additional pieces of hardware that are important for installing so you can tell what's going on in your system, whether your system, your filters are plugging or not, uh, are upstream indicators on filter heads. Keep in mind in most bulk installations, the, the pressure gauge will only show you what's going on essentially on the upstream side of the filter head or filter manifold because you're pumping into a tank that's going to atmospheric conditions. You're looking for pressure building up ahead of the filter to look at what, what restriction looks like or, or pressure buildup and loading of that filter looks like. So we have a couple of different connections here. These thread into all the indicator ports on the Clean Solutions product line, single heads, dual heads, and the high pressure bulk HP heads to give you upstream indication uh, and occasionally you see the, the, the uh, adapter over on the far right there. That is a downstream uh, indicator port connection. That's more for taking a nice clean sample downstream of the filter to ensure you have uh, proper cleanliness of a, of a filter and service. Gauges are also an important thing to include to tell what's going on. You really can't see restriction unless you have a gauge there to indicate it. The types and styles available vary widely from low cost, low pressure ones to much higher pressure and, and we even sell liquid filled gauges. Um, but you need to select that gauge yourself generally. It's uh, not that easy for, uh, for the supplier to determine what kind of pump and what kind of situation the filtration is going to be installed in. You need to understand what, what your pump is doing and what type of pressure and pressure drop you're going to be looking at. Uh, generally, they're put in the upstream indication uh, application just so that you can see restriction on the filter. And pick a range that makes sense. If you supply the 600 PSI gauge and you have a 30 pound pressure pump, you're never going to be able to see any, uh, any indication of what's going on in that system. The range needs to be chosen based on the application for the most part.
We do again recommend SAE connections to prevent leaks, but we do offer them in NPT. Uh, and you need to pick based on where it's going to be installed, whether it's a back mount or a bottom mount gauge, or perhaps a, a panel mount gauge where there's a connection on the back for uh, remote mounting. Uh, another thing that tends to get overlooked in installing filtration is what type of pump is pushing the fluid. Um, there's a couple of different types of pumps that are common, and the, uh, the most common type for truck offloading and most dispenser pumps would be something called a positive displacement pump. You can see a graph here roughly indicating how they behave. Um, as restriction increases on the, on the graph on the right, you see flow rate across the bottom and head pressure on the, on the vertical axis. As pressure drop increases, that pump continues to push. So it will push fluid through the filter and not decrease in flow rate much, even as restriction increases until a bypass opens. An on uh, fuel truck pump, for instance, will have a bypass rating where it, it starts to, to bypass uh, and not push flow because you've reached a pretty high uh, pressure drop. But that it that style of pump should continue to, to deliver and, and uh, get good filter life. Contrast that with the graph on the right. That is a rotodynamic pump or a centrifugal pump. Uh, that's more of a, a high volume transfer pump in most applications, but you will see those types of pumps in certain situations. And as you can see there, if you add just a modest amount of restriction, you back way up the pump curve and you can put something no more than five or six pounds of pressure drop additional in the line downstream of that pump and you will get half the flow rate out of the pump. That can be a significant issue in uh, filter service life. Uh, the customer doesn't want flow to decrease dramatically and you will be changing filters and not getting very much life out of them with that style of pump unless a change is made. And we highly recommend switching over to a gear gear pump or a rotodynamic pump, a, some, or a, something non-rotodynamic, a vein pump or something, uh, more of a positive displacement uh, type pump so you get better filter life and performance. Um, I mentioned earlier a little bit about restriction uh, and causing that, that, that pump behavior backing up on the curve. I'd like to cover that a little bit here. Uh, at the center at the top, you can see a single head uh, and a filter, the flow path flow comes in, it goes through the filter media and it goes out. Uh, to the, to, at the upper right there, you see uh, how our dual heads are plumbed. That can be confusing. People don't quite understand how the flow goes through those filters. Flow comes in, splits, 50% of it goes through one filter, 50% of it goes through the other filter. It comes, joins back together and leaves the head. Um, Here's more of a visual representation of one of those dual heads. Flow comes in, as you can see on the left there, goes through the filter media, goes back up and to, into the filter head, joins back together, and then leaves the filter head. So when we have a manifold of multiple filters, be it the four filter manifold, an eight or a 10 filter manifold, even the 12 does the same thing. The flow comes in, splits, goes equally into all the filters, and then joins back together on the other side. What's important to note there is that's how you decrease pressure drop. Decreasing the flow rate per filter is how you decrease pressure drop and increase loading in one of these situations. You can see on the filter curve graph there, there's a uh, curve at the bottom it's labeled as three centistokes or diesel fuel. Diesel is a very thin fluid. Even through a high efficiency filter like this, it has very low pressure drop because it's very thin. But to get capacity, we split that flow into multiple filters where you're flowing several hundred gallons per minute. It wouldn't be all that high a pressure drop on the filters, you just won't get very good life. Slowing the flow down is how you get the most in capacity in those filters. So that's the, that's the reason we use those manifolds. You can't put one filter after another, after after another, after another. You will just stack up pressure drop. You need to spread the flow out across the filters and bring it back together clean. Here's some, uh, just a, the range of filters we use for these kinds of installations. We typically start with the uh, fuel filter, the DBB8666 as the standard. Uh, it's nice high capacity uh, and it can handle a lot of flow rate. Um, we do have a, a couple of filters there, the ones with the snowflakes over them for winter applications. 
They tend to uh, alleviate a little bit of the gelling issue. They can handle winter winter diesel fuel uh, a little bit better if, if someone is having short filter life. And as you notice, we make those compact uh, filters there, both in the winter and the summer fuel, the DBB uh, 5333 filter there. That's a, uh, a short version of the, the, the normal fuel filter, and that's for small dispensers on pickup beds and that kind of thing. Uh, the the uh, polish section of our, our uh, or the protect section of our, our um, philosophy of clean the fuel on delivery and uh, protect it in service is done with a trap breather. That's to prevent uh, windblown particulate from getting in and to help manage moisture. Uh, trap breathers protect fuel uh, in, in storage. Once you've cleaned it, you might as well keep it that way. Um, one thing to note about these is it's very critical to know the, uh, the parameters of the installation. Uh, we don't have control of that supplying the breather. There's some very important information about the, the tank and how it's plumbed and how pumps are connected to it that are critical. You need to know, it's not the size of the tank that ultimately matters. You need to know the maximum inflow. So if it's a tanker truck of fuel, it can come in at generally 300 gallons a minute. Uh, if higher, you need to understand that. The most critical thing is the outflow flow rate. So if someone pumps out of the tank at an extremely high flow rate, you need to have a lot of breathers on there to manage that, to keep that very, very low. Vacuum is the, is the critical uh, parameter about these tanks that will prevent any uh, vacuum relief system from actuating or possibly collapsing a tank. That's very, very critical. It's not just the size of the tank. Uh, if you have high flow rate going out, you're going to need to put breathers in parallel, again, to decrease the vacuum that's that tank sees. There's a tank engineering data plate on every tank that says it can handle this much pressure and this much vacuum in normal service, and you need to size the, the application to stay under that. Uh, there's a, on the literature, there's a specifically a chart there that says what flow rate out of the filter creates what, what vacuum. And we've uh, added a remote mount uh, so you can have the breather mount on top of the tank and you can actually put the, the indicator down near the ground to see what the maximum restriction your breather has been seeing. Uh, so you're changing it long before it builds any significant restriction that could uh, endanger a tank. So. Uh, Make sure you know what you're doing when you're installing a trap breather on a tank. Uh, additionally, for, for more robust uh, water management to prevent condensation from the inside of the tank from ever occurring is something we can do it's, uh, by drying the headspace of the reservoir using our uh, reservoir air dryer. Uh, it's a small continuous flow dry air producing device. You hook compressed air up to it and connect it to the headspace of the tank. It provides dry air to purge the headspace of the tank, preventing condensation, and simply flows out the breather continuously, keeping the headspace dry, the breather completely dry, and stops uh, condensation water from occurring and, and collecting the bottom of the tank. Uh, it's just a, a small low flow, uh, half a CFM of, of uh, air flowing out of it continuously over the tank, you can stop thousands of gallons from condensing in large tanks with, a, with an application like this uh, over time. It's a very effective means of managing that. It's not available at most fuel tanks, uh, but it is available for virtually all uh, lube tanks because they use air-operated pumps to, uh, to move lubricants to hose reels and things like that. So you can apply it where you can. There's usually a little bit of a discussion on how to, how to set it up if you do one of these, but uh, it's a pretty straightforward solution. Uh, finally, on implementation uh, for uh, planning and where you're going to put things, uh, how you get things put in there and service them, and some concerns with getting uh, stuff installed in, a, in someone else's tank. Um, filtration uh, location and local codes. It's important on a, a bulk fuel site. There's usually a containment wall of some sort around the place. It may be a double-walled tank, which has its own self-containment, generally. Um, but there are local codes that you need to consider a lot of times. 
you'll want to install that filtration where it's still within the containment uh, types of plumbing, that kind of thing, maybe codes on the, on the people doing the install. Um, usually the smaller stuff, little kits and things like that can be done on your own and depending upon the ability of the, the customer or if they do their own piping on site or something, you may end up ask, asking an end customer uh, um, if they're using a, a piping engineering firm or a piping contractor to do major plumbing on a large tank farm. Um, the little kits, you can typically install those yourself. It's some NBT threads there, as you can see, and, uh, and just fit it however it needs to be, depending upon how the pump is installed on a tank. Um, even the higher flow kit stuff with just a dual head system or two heads of particulate and a water removal head, pretty straightforward NBT threads. Here you see that that kit comes with the code 61 flanges for that style of head. Uh, but when you get into a large project here with 10, 10 filter manifolds installed uh, uh, with five in service and five in standby, that's an engineering project and you're going to be working with a piping contractor somewhere. This is happens to be at a fuel terminal, but uh, it's a pretty extreme amount of piping plumbing. But plumbing supports access for serv serviceability, drainability, where you can get at the filters and drain from a low point to remove or, or save any fuel. Uh, when you're doing filter change out, that's important. We don't see when people install uh, uh, filtration manifolds down underneath a tank or something. Here you can see a double wall containment, 10,000 gallon storage tank, very common here. The truck hooked up there to the connection where they have the collection box for any drip, um, just plumbs to the manifold. There's a drip tray there and room to get at that and collect that fluid. Uh, if you, when you do have to change filters, and then it just goes back up to the normal connection into the tank. It's a nice, neat installation. The, the stand there was built by the people that did the plumbing install. Pretty straightforward stuff. Um, here's a couple of manifolds, a particulate removal manifold followed by a water removal manifold. It's a little hard to see in the angle of this camera, but it's, it's, it's hanging over the containment area there for uh, for installation inside the wall there in case there's any uh, leakage when filters are changed or anything. It's also up where you can get the filters underneath and get at it and uh, room to put a drip tray or something in there for, for uh, collection of, of, of fluid. Um, here's a, an inline 12 manifold set up in a situation where there's a drain port at the bottom that can be used uh, so you can drain that thing down when it's, when it's shut off at the valve over there. Uh, here's another with uh, in a horizontal position. You can drain most of the manifold out of the, the port connections there, but you can also take a filter off the bottom and drain that way. So uh, it just depends on the site. This is always, almost always installing the stuff after plumbing has been built, so it's never the same twice. Uh, here's a set of manifolds uh, in a lubricant application, but this, these replaced a couple of large pots and tanks. Uh, so the, the main plumbing was already there, but this was set up to be able to drain all but just a gallon or so of fluid that re remains in the filters after it's drained down. They can save 75 gallons of fluid they used to have to waste. They uh, basically pump out the bottom there and, and save the filtered fluid and uh, change the filters quickly in just a few minutes. It's designed well for serviceability. Uh, just makes it more convenient. So again, our, our objectives here were to uh, consider uh, things to consider before you install, uh, cleaning, protecting, and polishing, where can I put stuff, what kind of contractors do I need, that kind of thing. How to make sure, you make sure the system is functional and serviceable. You have pressure gauges where you need them, you can put sample ports in where you need them, and make sure you have uh, access to the filters. You likely are gonna be changing these filters uh, based on fuel volume and usage and how to put it all together, sort of how to diff different orientations and locations, uh, types of plumbing connections, that kind of thing that make it uh, leak proof and, and uh, nice and neat and clean and easy to service. Thank you for your time on this webinar. Uh, we'll, uh, there are several topics that were brushed over in this one that you might see on our My Clean Diesel site if you didn't get to this video by that. And be sure to connect with us if there if you have not. We uh, continue to post these uh, helpful videos and uh, add information on the site uh, over time as we get it. And thank you for your time.